Hello and welcome to the first series in this tutorial. In this series we're going to be creating a crate asset for a video game which is optimized as far as geometry. It's going to be textured and it'll be ready for export. So in this first video we're going to be talking about modeling and if you have a strong understanding of modeling already uh, you might want to go ahead and skip this video and go straight to the UV section. Uh, if you're brand new to Maya, you should definitely start here because there is going to be a review of a couple of tools that are really helpful and I think you should get a little handle on. So if you haven't already downloaded Maya at home, I suggest you go ahead and do that right now. So if you go into, um, go into Chrome or whatever, you look up Maya Students. I just happened to Google that and then you'll come up with this site right here. It's free student software downloads. And what Autodesk does is offers students anywhere in the world the ability to download their software and use it for free. And that's the reason that everybody loves Maya so much is because they ended up using it because it was free and it was powerful. And um, we get hooked on it. You know, we, we get hooked on it as a student and um, we go into our professional life and we download that. And, you know, good business model in my opinion. But uh, if you're interested in other things besides 3D modeling, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, one, two, three D catch is a really cool one where you can take photographs of an object, export those into the cloud, and it does some really cool calculations and spits out a 3D model for you. Very, very cool stuff. If you've ever played the game um, uh, blah, 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 Vanishing of Ethan Carter, they use this technique actually quite a bit in their asset design. And there's all sorts of other stuff. Uh, wow. Oh, yeah. I didn't even realize um, how big their ecosystem is. So Autodesk does this thing where they like to buy out the, the really, really cool emerging technologies and then integrate them into their software uh, lineup, which is cool. Uh, not as good for the industry as some might want, but it, I think it's nice because Autodesk has the money. They put in a lot of good tech, and most of the time, most of the time, their software works really well. So, let's start taking a look at Maya 2015. So, right away, there is a grid when you start up Maya 2015. So, on this grid, by default, each one of these little spaces is a centimeter wide. So, each one of these is a square centimeter. So, you have to keep in mind when you're modeling about the size of your object, because it actually does matter when we take these in from, or we export these from Maya into, excuse me, into UE4, it's going to depend, or the size is going to make a big difference in the engine. It's actually going to be scaled correctly. And other things like lighting in the uh, editor right here is going to dictate, it's going to be dictated by the size, as well as weird camera effects and stuff, um, rendering stuff. So generally, if you're modeling something, uh, you want to keep it to the scale. And I wouldn't recommend making something that's bigger than double the size of the scale. Uh, if you are doing that, we should switch to meters, which we will talk about in a moment. So first things first, uh, let's have something to play around with. Well, actually, first things first, I should talk about the cameras first. So if you hold down the Alt button and you click in on the left uh, the left button on your mouse, you'll be able to scroll around. So what this is doing is wherever you click, you're going to pan around it. Or actually, I suppose you'll pan around everything or anything that was last selected. So if you have an object over here and it's selected, you'll pan around that. Scroll wheels, zoom. If you hold down the Alt key and you press in on your scroll wheel, this is a pan function. I use this quite frequently. And that's about it as far as camera controls, which I use like all the time. Uh, alt to pan, um, scroll to scroll, Alt push in on middle mouse to pan. Um, yeah, that's basically it as far as camera controls. There's a couple other weird functions that I maybe use every once in a while, but 99% of the time, those are the controls I'm using. So the right mouse button is handling all sorts of stuff, uh, mostly our tool selection. So let's talk about that real quick. I'm going to create a new box, and I can zoom, it up, zoom in up on it. And you can see that by default, it is set to one centimeter square or cubed rather. Um, and we can take a look at that over here in these uh, attributes and channel boxes. So I'm going to turn these off real quick. 
And let's start off with the one on the right, the one on the very right. This is our channel box. So the channel box dictates where it is, this object is in space. You can see translate X, Y, and Z. If I put in like a two in our Z, you can see that it moved over here. I'm just gonna move it back. Rotate is the same thing, but by degrees. So if I put in 90 degrees, oh, <laughs> it won't visually, visibly change because um, we'll, we'll do 12 degrees, something weird. There we go. So you can see if you're looking for really precise degree increments, you can do it that way. The scale is the same thing, you know, really cool. This was a kind of like old school modeling. Um, at one point in time, there wasn't really so much of a, a manipulator to use like uh, we will be using. You had to type in a lot of numbers. There's less of that these days, which is good for us. And if you click on the inputs tab, there's a polycube one, um, whatever your object is. If you click on that, it'll give you some information about that as well. And this is changing some stuff about the dimensions, the dimensions as well. So if I wanted this to be two units wide, I could type it in there rather than changing the scale. I just set the width uh, in the first place. And you can do subdivisions. So if I put this to three, you can see now it's subdivided. I can do this all around. So that's pretty cool and pretty useful. Cool. So let's take a look at some of the other controls. If you press on the W key, you will be brought to the translate tool. W for translate. If your arrows have to be really big or really small, what you can do is when you're using a tool, you can press the plus key or the minus key, to change the size of that. Just something to keep in mind. So this is the move tool. It's really, really simple. So the idea is that you click and drag on an arrow in the direction that it's pointing and that'll move it. It won't move it in any other direction except the way the arrow is pointing or the axis the arrow is pointing, I should say. But in 2015, they added this really cool feature where there's these little tiny little squares. And what these are is actually the ability to move things in two axes. So say I want to move this a little bit over here, but I don't want to move it up and down. Grab this little thing, and you can see that it's on the same axis. It's like hovering on the ground, right? But I can move it around wherever I want. This is really, really cool, and I'm glad they added it in. You can also grab the selector right in the middle, and this will be moving the box in relationship to the camera orientation. So if I move it over here, if I move the camera over here and I move this like this, it's moving the box based on the camera location. So it shouldn't be moving it in the um, one of these axes. You can see that it didn't. So that's just one thing to remember. I typically don't use that often. It's, um, in my opinion, not that useful. So the next one we want to look at is rotate. So we click on the rotate and we get this really cool little doohickey. And this is very similar to the other one. Um, there's a red, blue, and green circle. If you click on it, it'll start to rotate for you. Really, really cool. Click and drag. And I'm hitting Control-Z to undo all these actions, by the way. Uh, it's standard pretty much anywhere. Um, oh, if you want to uh, rotate things by uh, precise increments, if you hold down the J key and you click and then rotate, it's going to snap it by 15 degree increments. And I use this quite frequently if I want to move things to like a 90 degree angle. Um, it's much easier than going over here and typing it in. Just hold down the J key and flip that around. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the last tool we're going to look at over here is the scale tool. Oh, and I should mention that you should be using the the uh, shortcut keys, W E R, for selecting all these tools. And this is the selector is very similar to the translate, except it's in scale. So grab this; it scales in that direction. The middle one is uniform. Th that's actually more useful. And then this one is in just two axes, which is really, really cool. All right, so that's a general overview of the tools that you will be using 99% of the time. So 
the next thing we want to look at is how to control different components of our geometry. So if you remember in class, I was talking about how we break things up. How is uh, this piece of geometry being generated? Well, the way it's being generated is by these components. The main components are vertices. And remember, those are the little points in space that are floating around. Those are connected by edges, which are these green lines. And then in between the edges, we have faces. And in this case, because these edges create squares, we have a cube. So right now we're in object mode, which means I can click off to the side, look around. I can see it. There's an object here. If I click on it, it turns green. That means I'm in object mode. If I have multiple objects, the one I select will be green, and that means I can move it, scale it, whatever. So if we want to actually change the shape of this, I'm oh, sorry about that. If we want to actually change the shape of this object, we have to start manipulating things like faces and edges and vertices. So let's start doing that. Let's go into, well, let's do face mode first. So I'm going to right click. I'm not holding down any other buttons. I'm just right clicking and holding that down. And then I get this rotating, uh, it kind of reminds me of like the Mass Effect decision wheels. Um, and you see that there's a bunch of different words which uh, actually flip us into different modes. So I want to choose the face mode because I want to select faces. So now you can see that your object turns blue. And then when you hover over a face, it turns red. Well, if you click on that face, it'll turn like an amber. So what that means is now I have just this face selected. And the way this works is that because this face is selected, it's going to influence all of these edges and the vertices attached to those edges. So we're working our way down. We'll start with the biggest to smallest. So faces to edges to vertices. So general editing is done with the faces. So I can scale this in. So I'm in the scale tool. I'm just scaling it in, scaling it up. I can grab my translate tool and I can like bring it down, bring it up. Pretty cool. And I can even go into my rotate tool and rotate an entire face. Pretty freaking sweet. So the next thing I want to do is go back into object mode, which I did a little quickly. I'm sorry about that. So I just hold down the right key or the, the right mouse button and then go into object mode and select it. And the next thing I want to try out is edge mode. So instead of going down for face, we're going to go up for edge. And now you can see it's very similar where the edges turn red when you hover over them and when you click it, it'll turn amber. So this is very same thing. You can scale these or <laughs> translate them rather. You can scale them and you can even rotate them. Although there's not too many instances where I'm rotating edges that often, at least not in this, in this case. So now I got a really weird looking shape going on. So I'm going to go into my last mode, which is the vertice mode, uh, or vertex mode rather. Uh, right click on your object again, and then you'll see there's a vertex mode. So I'm going to click on that real quick. And now you can actually see that there's these tiny little pink dots at the intersections of all these edges. And those are our actual vertices. So vertices are the things that actually matter when we're talking about geometry. These are the things that we're counting. These are the things that are driving edges, which are driving faces. These are the most com important components in our geometry. And it works very similar to the other modes, but there's a couple of things that don't really change. So rotate. Uh, because it's a single point in space, it doesn't matter what the orientation is. So rotate's not going to do anything. If we go into scale, once again, it's just a point in space. So scale doesn't do anything either. What's the most important thing for uh, a point in space is its point in space. So we're going to use the translate tool to affect vertices. And you can see that you can just click on it and drag it around. And vertices is pretty much the only instance where I'll use this middle box on the uh, up on the uh, translate tool. So you can see that this is this is your sculpting toolkit, right? So if you imagine 
taking a shape and creating something with it. Uh, you're, using, you're using these tools to kind of block out your model and then add detail later. Um, so these are the important tools that you'll have to learn to get really used to over the next few months. All right, so let's talk about something else. I think I'm going to go ahead and delete this. The next thing I want to do is create a new box. So I'm going to scale up this box so it's not really tiny. And I want to make it so it's kind of more like a crate um, crate size, I guess. Something like that. I imagine a crate to look somewhat like that, have those certain proportions. So I'm just going to start jumping in and changing the geometry around because uh, a lot of the time if I'm going into Maya, uh, I won't have like a, a clear vision of what I'm going to model. I just go in and I start playing around and it's kind of like my concepting phase. Um, so one thing I kind of want to do is turn this crate into like a typical box crate. Let's do that. So we can do that pretty simply by going into face mode. And actually, before we do that, let's take a look at some reference. I always recommend looking up reference material before you start working on stuff, because there's a lot of times where you think you know what something looks like, but maybe it actually really doesn't look like what you think it does. So this is the crate that we all know and love in video games, right? It's absolutely standard square crate. You stand on them, you shoot them, their cover, whatever. Um, but I would recommend doing something that's a little bit um, more <laughs> outside of the box. Excuse the pun. Um, so something maybe more along the lines of one of these, you know, milk crate like this. Um, I actually did a, a few models of uh, crates like this in the past, and it was a great learning material because there's a bunch of different um, shapes and stuff. It's really, really cool. Um, so something other than a flat box crate. I think I'm going to pick this one here. And this one's kind of interesting to me. So I'm going to view the image, and this is now going to be my reference. This is what I'm shooting for. So we can see that this is kind of broken up into a few pieces. Uh, the main bit is going to be this kind of uh, this this main rectangular piece, right? And what I want to do is I want to make this square inside of it first. I think that's where I'm going to start. So let's take a look. If I go into face mode and I select the face that I want, how would I make a face within this face? Hmm. Well, one thing I can do is what's called an extrusion. So we were playing around with extrusions and clash, and we're going to do one right now. So there is the button up here, which is the extrude tool. But I'm actually going to use a quicker means of getting to that because, man, moving my wrist way up there, that's pretty difficult. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down the shift key and I'm sorry, uh, the control key. No, I'm lying again. Oh, I'm sorry. It was the shift key. Sometimes I get ahead of myself. So I'm in face mode and I'm selecting a face and then I hold down the shift key and then I right click and then there is this tool down here called extrude face. So I'm going to click on that and you'll see that a couple of things have changed. Uh, the main difference is now that there's this selector which looks like a weird hybrid of everything. It's got like this weird circle which is the rotate. It's got like cubes on top of arrows. So the arrows are translating the cubes are the scale. So if we look at our reference what I really want to do is have a smaller square on this bigger square, right? So I want to scale this first. So what I want to do is click on these tiny little, maybe I'll scale that up a little bit. What I want to do is click on these tiny little boxes and that'll switch into scale mode. You have to make sure that you're not moving when you click these because that can change the translation. So just one click, there we go. And now you can see that there's this blue box in the middle and that's the same as the normal uh, uh, scale tool where it's a uniform scale. So I'm going to click on that and then I'm going to drag to the left and there we go. Pretty easy. So what I'd really want to do is do that 
and then do this side. Well, I can do the same thing I did over here, but I can actually do them at the same time. So I'm gonna undo Control Z, Control Z, and I have to make sure, see, I can see the, the extrusion tool is still here, so that means I have the extrusion still applied, so I have to undo one more time, undo, actually another time, undo, and that should be it. Sometimes I check by selecting the face and moving it around to make sure there's not a duplicate there. There doesn't seem to be. So now what I want to do is select this face and select this face at the same time. And I do that by just holding down the shift key and clicking again. Shift means extra select. If you have a face that you don't want selected, so say this top one, what you can do is hold down the control button. And that's just a minus selection. Very, very easy, very cool. So the next thing we want to do is the same thing we did before, which is an extrusion. And because these two faces aren't actually touching, it's going to handle them independently, which means, well, I guess I'll show you. So I'm going to right or hold down shift and then right click extrude face. And I get my manipulator, but you will, you'll notice that there's not one on the other side. So what's happening is when I change one of these, it's going to change both of the faces. So I'm going to scale this in like I did before. I'm going to take a look at the other side. Bam. Same thing. Piece of cake. So now I know that this side is perfectly symmetrical to this side. And that's exactly what I want. So the next thing I want to do is one more extrusion, but I want to pull it in this time so that it's inset. We can see that again. There's this lip right here. We have to create that next. So I can do that real quick. Uh, let's say, well, you know what? I'll show you a really cool trick. I'm still in the extrude tool. As you can see, that I still have the tool there. If I move the scale around, it's still going to change it. But what I can do, uh, what I can do from here is hit the G key, and what the G key does is repeat last function. So before I do that, let me show you what happens if I try to move this back and forth. It's not exactly what I want, but if I hit the G key, which has made a new extrusion, and now I pull it back, well, look what's changed. It's generated these faces in the middle. And now I have a shape which is pretty reminiscent of the one that are, uh, of our reference. So that's exactly what I want. Easy peasy. <clears throat> so the next thing I want to do is start adding a little bit more geometry. So let's take a look again. We have what seems to be some 2x4s or whatever size those actually are, uh, propping this up so it's like standing it up, which is pretty cool. I didn't even notice the first time. And then we have another one that's going across the top. So I'm just going to eyeball it. So there's four of them, so it has to be, hmm, okay. So I'm going to create a new box, but where is it? Well, it's actually inside of the box that we created. And because it's so large, it's actually encapsulating the other one. If I zoom in real quick, you can see that it's here still. If I hit the W key for translate, I can move it up and out of the way so I can actually get it to where I want it. So what I'm going to do is first pull it in the middle and kind of get it to where it resembles the right size. <clears throat> so I'm going to do that by first aligning up the end of this to really close the face. Maybe not touching, but pretty close to this object. And then the next thing I want to do is grab this face and I'm going to pull it in. So you see what I did there? I'll do it again because it was a little fast. I click on the object and I go into face mode. I click on this face and I'm translating it by moving it this way. Instead of using the scale tool, which would have scaled it in both ways, um, I'm just moving one face, which is doing the same thing almost. So the next thing I can do is grab this face and kind of move it in so it kind of a little bit closer to our reference. Let's check again. Actually, I think it's a little thinner. Right about there. And thickness a little bit in. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just guessing at this point. So the next thing I want to do is grab this face 
bring it up so it kind of meets where the next one will be. And then I'm going to grab this one and drag it all the way to the bottom. And it's got that weird feet type thing. So there we go. So now we have the basic shape. Pretty sweet. Ooh, let me go into object mode real quick. I'll click on my object. Now you'll see that my selector is no longer in the center of my object. And that's because I've been scaling things around. So to fix that, we can go into the top menu up here and with our object selecting, selected, go to edit, I'm sorry, uh, modify and scroll down to right about the middle to center pivot. We click on that and it's gonna average where this should be. In this case, put it straight in the middle, which is kind of where I want it. So <clears throat> I'll leave it right there. So before I create four more of these, uh, let's create I want to create one whole section. So what I mean by that is I want to create this plank, this plank, and the corresponding plank going on this side. So let's do that real quick. And now what we can actually use is this same shape over and over. So what I can do is hit Control D with my object selected. That's duplicate. And I can just drag this straight over. And then I'm going to do it again. This time I'll use uh, Control Copy, Control C, Control V, and I have a copy. They do pretty much the same thing, but a little different, I guess. <laughs> I'm not really sure why they're different, but all right. So I'm going to grab my rotate, hold down the J key so I can snap it into position. And you can see that it's not quite wide enough for me. So what I'm going to do is kind of line it just about right with one side. That side looks good. And then I have to go into face mode and then drag this edge out so it meets this one. And you can see that these aren't quite tall enough yet. But instead of grabbing these faces and pulling them up, I'm going to shift select these and then just drag these up so they meet. And I want them to not quite meet perfectly because I want there to be a little bit of you know, a defect, I guess. So I think that looks pretty good. So the shading on this model is a little bit flat right now. It's a little boring. So I'm going to click on a couple options up here, which will make this a little bit more pretty. First thing we're going to do is screen space ambient occlusion. I'm going to click on that. <clears throat> and you can see what that did is add some shadow where items are meeting. I like to keep this on because it's a little bit more visually interesting. Uh, and then two over from that is the multi-sample anti-aliasing. And I'm going to click on that. And what that's doing is making things a little bit smoother. And I think that just looks a whole lot better. It's more pleasing to work with. So I'm going to go back into face mode. This is bothering me that's so far away. I'm going to pull it up. That looks better. So the next thing I want to do is move these and duplicate them so that I have all four. So what I'll do is actually select all three of these and what I'm going to do is come up here under mesh and I'm going to combine these so up here in the top menu it's just mesh and then combine and what that did for me is combined these three pieces into one piece which now has a center pivot so I can move this around just like this and they're all connected really cool so now I can move this from the center to right about here and at this point I'm just eyeballing it I'm gonna hit control D to duplicate move it over control D to duplicate move it over and one more time control D to duplicate duplicate and move over so cool right away we have a pretty interesting looking crate not too shabby so let's take a look at our reference again. Uh, if you're really a stickler, you could go in and model each individual plank if, really, if you really wanted to. Um, I don't suggest doing that right away, especially if you're new. But if you want to like blow us all away at presentations, go ahead and do it. So let's talk about a couple other cool tools. So I'm going to use the isolate select. I'm just going to select this box and I'm going to use this tool up here, the isolate select to just make everything else invisible. 
And what I want to do is soften up my edges. So I'll show this once on one edge and then we'll do it multiple times on other edges. So I'm going to do this with a bevel. So I'm going to select one edge and I'm going to hold down shift and right click and there's a bevel edge tool. So I'm going to click on that real quick and you'll see what it did is created two edges out of one edge. And this is useful for us because there's hardly ever knife edge straight edges like this in the real world. There's almost always a little bit of uh, taper. So maybe this isn't the size I want it. Say we want to change that. <coughs> Excuse me. So the way we can do that is by looking in our channel box, which is the one up here, clicking on that. And with our object selected, you can see that there is this poly bevel one which was actually the last thing that we did. So this is a little bit of a history of all of the last of the uh, the tools that we've used on this. So I'm going to click on poly bevel one and that gives us these options. And uh, but these affect a whole bunch of stuff. But the one I'm most concerned about is this roundness. So if I change this roundness to a 0.5 to a 0.2, I'm sorry, not roundness, 0.5. Uh, the fraction from a 0.5 to a 0.2 you'll see what that did is made this much smaller and that's pretty close to what I want actually and what I really want to do is do the same thing to all four corners so I'm gonna do that real quick I'm actually gonna select the last three right click bevel edge and then I have to make sure I go into the new poly bevel so this is poly bevel 2 I'm going to change the fraction from 0.5 to 0.2. And then I'm going to visually check that they're all the same size. And they seem to be. So that's pretty cool. So I'm going to go into object mode. And you can see that that's created a nice, softer edge for us. And I really like that. So before we go back into the other mode and check out the rest of our planks, I have to show you a problem that we just created by doing this. And if you haven't guessed it already, what we've done is created an n-gon. And if you remember from class, an n-gon is a polygon shape with more than five sides. So in traditional modeling, we're going to stick with four-sided faces and three-sided faces. But in this case, we have some, uh, actually more than five. So let's count. In this face right here, we have one, two, three four, five, six. We have six edges. So this is a problem. We have to take care of this right away. And there's a couple ways we can do this. One way is to take this vertice right here, this vertex, and move it so that it's connected to this one down here. <laughs> this one right here. So moving it down to there, essentially. And there's a tool that will allow us to do that. So what I'll do is go into object mode first, and I'm going to hold down shift and right click. I'm sorry, no, first I have to be in vertex mode. Vertex mode. And I have to hold down uh, shift, right click, and there is this merge vertices. So that's what I want to do. I want to take one vertice and move uh, and attach it to the next one so I'm gonna go to merge and this is gonna give me a few more options and the next thing I want to choose is the merge vertex tool so this is a really cool tool which I use quite often and actually I keep it up here because I use it so often so now you can see that uh, I have these crosshairs and what I'm gonna do is select the, the vertice that I want moved with this tool and you'll see that it's made it red and the next thing I want to do is drag it to the vertice I want it connected to. And that would be this one right here. And I have to make sure that this is exactly on the one I want. This tool is a little bit finicky when it gets to um, vertices because it'll select things behind what you're looking at. And you'll and you're accidentally attach vertices to things on the other side of your model. I do that constantly. Um, so I'm going to let go of this right now and visually check that it did what I wanted and it seems to have. So that's perfect. 
Then I'm going to do this over here. And then over here. And then over here. Perfect. And now I know my other side has the same problem, so I can come over here, do the same thing. I love this tool. It's so nice. There's a couple other ways to do this, but I suggest getting to... Oh, see what I was just about to do? I was just about to let go. And if I had done that, look what happened. It snapped it to this one back here. And that's not what I want. So I have to undo that real quick. Click and then drag. Perfect. So let's do a face count again. Or an edge count rather. One, two, three, four. And then these ones are triangles. And that works well for, works well for us. So let's think about some other edges that we can do the same treatment for. How about these edges that go all the way around? Now, if you remember, I just selected this whole edge loop. And the way I did that by, was by clicking on one edge and then double clicking it. And the next thing I can do is right click with holding shift bevel edge and that looks pretty cool but you know what I kind of want to do the other edge as well so I'm going to undo that I still have this edge selected and I'm going to double click on this edge and now I have both of these edge loops so now I can hold down shift right and click bevel edge and I think that looks pretty good off the bat so now we have a pretty cool looking box now I can get out of my isolate select so I get out of that and that's looking pretty good. So this is very, very simple. Uh, I don't want to make this video way too long, but I want you to use these techniques to make a really, really awesome, impressive crate. So let's take a look at what I think you guys could shoot for. Do, 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 do. Something like this would be pretty freaking sweet. Where we have many, many objects. Um, boop, 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 boop. Hmm. If you want to do something creative, uh, like uh, from Borderlands, Borderlands. You know, if you want to do something sci-fi, like uh, a crate like this, you can see that there's a lot more detail that you can spend time modeling. Uh, if you have the time, go for it. You know. Uh, blow us away with your model. Um, it would be really, really awesome to see something like this from you guys. So, um, shoot for something really awesome. You know, uh, try not to do this. If you're having a really rough time in Maya, um, and it's taking you a long time to follow along, uh, then do something simple like this. Just do it as well as you can. You know, um, I can tell if you put a lot of time into an object uh, or not. Whether it's really, really detailed and crazy looking, or if it's really simple. Um, so pick and choose your battles. I suggest uh, going the extra mile on the modeling because I think that's one of the most important parts. I almost left without going over one of my most favorite new tools in Maya 2015. So really quickly, uh, I'd like you guys to start using this tool early on because it's very powerful and it actually replaces about three or four different tools that used to be in older versions of Maya. And that tool is the multi-cut tool. New in Maya 2015, woohoo! So let's select uh, just the object right here. And I'm going to go into my multi-cut tool. I'm going to click that real quick. And I can see that right away this gives me a lot of control over drawing lines. So what I mean by that is that if I wanted to draw a, vertice, uh, a line from here to here, all I'd have to do is click on one vertice and drag all the way over to here. And then before I can finish, I have to hit enter. So I just pressed enter and that completes the action for me. So in this case, you wouldn't really need a line going in through here and breaking this up into two triangles. So I'd undo it real quick. So this is one of the main functions of this tool. It also will draw points in space. So this is really, really cool. So say I wanna drag, a, I wanna make a new line from here and I want to point just like in the middle of this of this face. All I have to do is click in the middle of the face, and bam, there is a space uh, point there now. I can just click and drag over here to make sure 
I connect to the edge of this, enter, double, ch double check to make sure it's worked, and it looks like it has. So obviously I just created an end gone here, which I'd have to fix, so I can do that real quick. I just go from here to here, enter, here to here, enter. And that's really, really cool. Um, you could go so far as to go like, uh, just start cutting through stuff. I can't even express how cool something like this is. Uh, very, very, very cool, powerful tool. And obviously, if you wanted to not make this an end gun, it would take a lot of work. But this is something that you guys should be playing around with early on because it's got so much functionality with it. Another really cool thing it can do is insert an edge loop. So I haven't talked about edge loops yet, but what an edge loop is is splitting uh, polygons in half. So long as they're all quads, it'll keep going around your entire object. So if you hold down the uh, control button, you'll see that I get this like uh, edge loop. And wherever I click, I will add a new edge loop. And this is literally a loop of edges that goes all the way around your object. So cool. I get, uh, I'm gushing over it right now because I love it so much. Another cool thing is holding down shift, that'll snap uh, to center, I believe. Yep, so I can press enter on that. And that snapped my line straight to the center of my object. Snap here, oop, <laughs> it snapped to the center of this object again. Uh, so it'll snap to the center of your edge, so any edge. Oop, I have to press enter even though I don't want that. So I'd do, I'd first press on this one and then I'd hold down shift, snap, snap. Oh, 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 I messed up there, but you get the general idea. So use this tool as much as you can, as early as you can, and get an understanding of uh, how to get the most out of it. Um, there's probably even more functionality, which I haven't mentioned. Um, I guarantee there is. Uh, uh, oh, a really cool one is if you hold down the shift key and you draw a line, you slice through it. Oh, that's so cool. And I think if you hold down a uh, shift and then alt, no, shift and then control, no. Ah, yes, shift and control does edge loops um, on the grid, which is nice. So if you want an edge loop straight down the middle, you can just do that. I still don't know all the functionality of this tool because there's just so much to it. So, one more time. Get as much as you can out of it as early as you can. Uh, but always, always, always make sure to check your work after you've completed a line um, or an edge loop or anything like that. Check to make sure that it's worked correctly because this tool, because it is so new, is a little bit finicky with certain functions. So, double check your work. All right. And with that, we're going to move on to UV unwrapping.